Welcome back to our study over the book of Hebrews. This summer we are going through the book and we're doing a reading plan together as a church at NCC. And throughout this reading plan, we are delving a little bit deeper into the book. And and if you remember from our last time together, one of the things I said is you really need to have the Old Testament in one hand as you read the book of Hebrews and the other hand. And I mean, we jump right into it today to realize why that is so necessary. So uh, I'm glad you're back and joining us and and delving deeper into this study. And I hope that as you do so, it transforms and and deepens your faith as well. So last week, we talked about something called a chiasm. And if you remember, a chiasm has a format where the centerpiece is the main piece. And throughout that chiasm, there is inclusios where you have B and B and A and A that makes sense to make sure that A C is then emphasized. Now, as soon as we get into the meat of the text, we quickly see that that chiasm is pretty prevalent, that, that literary form is pretty prevalent in the book of Hebrews. And, and more than that, one of the things I said last week is that it is important that we see the, the sermon or the teaching style of the first century as a centerpiece or as a form that the rest of the book of Hebrews follows. Namely, that in the early first century, the teachers would use a text, they would read it, and then they would teach on or ask questions on it. As soon as we get into verse 5, we are just inundated with scripture. And and much of this scripture comes from the Psalms. But very quickly on, we have this section from uh, Hebrews 5, chapter 1, verse 5, down to Hebrews 1, verse 13, that is all scripture quotations. It, it's all from the books, from, from the Psalms, from Isaiah, from Deuteronomy, but a lot of it has to do with what are called coronation psalms. And a coronation psalm is something that would have been read at the coronation of a king, but it really tied into the the reign and the supremacy of God over his people. And so the Davidic or the, the, the king of Israel was not like a monarchy in the ancient world. Uh, a monarch in the ancient world. Think for example of Egypt. Pharaoh was a god. Pharaoh was the god that had a seat at the council, at the pantheon of the rest of Egypt's gods. But Pharaoh was worshipped by his people as a god. Hebrew culture was different. and Most other cultures, every other culture in the ancient Near East, looked more like Egypt. But at the center of Israel was a theocracy. The king acted in the same sense of a priest, in the sense that they were a mediator between God, but they weren't God. They were chosen by God, but they weren't God. God was the king of Israel. That was what was meant to be the center. And so all these coronation psalms, psalms that would have been read at the coronation of a king, psalms that tie to a throne or sovereignty, supremacy, they all are talking in terms of God's sovereignty, God's supremacy, God's throne room, not David's, or not another king's, but but God. Now, those are called coronation psalms, or in some cases, messianic psalms. And Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, ties those directly to Jesus. And so we get, very quickly, we jump into this, and he's referencing these different psalms, and we get the chiasm in the sense that we have this structure of um, the section where the psalmist here is talking about what Jesus is greater than. He's talking he's greater than the angels. And then you have this section where the psalmist is talking about, well, what is the Son? The section that comes down to here. And then he closes with another section on he's greater than the angels. And so this, what that tells us is this middle section here of uh, from but to the Son... And down to, but you are the same and years will never end. This is the centerpiece of what 
the author of Hebrews is saying it means that the emphasis that Jesus is the the Davidic king, the 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 one that the Hebrews have been waiting for, the one that Israel has been waiting for, he is the Messiah. He's greater than anyone else. He's he's greater than the angels. He's greater than the kings that become that come before him. And he's on par with God himself because we see here where the author of Hebrews he says, "But to the son," meaning this isn't from scripture necessarily. It's he's using this as an exposition of what scripture means. He's saying, "But to the son, your throne, God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. Meaning that Jesus isn't just like another angel. He's not just another messenger from God. And, and keep in mind that that word um, angel, it's, it's from the Greek angelos. And that word just simply means messenger. It doesn't mean this supernatural being with fluttery wings. It's, it's often used... To reference the beings that God sends, the, the, the angels that we call them, like Gabriel, it, it's used to reference Gabriel, but angelos, angel, doesn't necessarily mean a spiritual being with fluttery wings. It was often used to describe someone who sent a letter from um, a Roman centurion to someone else. It was used as a messenger. What the author of Hebrews is saying, what the teacher is saying, is Jesus isn't just someone that came from God to teach, to give a message. He's not someone that just came like the prophets of old or like the, the beings that came to Abraham to give him a message of something. He's God. He sits on the throne forever and ever. He is the Davidic king, and, and the scepter of his kingdom is a scepter of justice. And in the beginning, he was there when the earth was established. The heavens and the works are of his hands. They will all perish, but Jesus will remain. From the onset, the, the author of Hebrews, is he's, he's establishing the supremacy of Jesus. And he does so by alluding to the Old Testament, by connecting these coronation psalms, these messianic psalms, these teachings from the Old Testament he directly attributes them to Jesus in, in the same way that you would in a teaching in the first century. So, after these first 14 verses of the first chapter of the book of Hebrews, we then come to the teaching. So he starts by laying out the Old Testament reasoning for the supremacy of, of Jesus, for the superiority of Jesus, and then... In the Greek, we get this word that's, that uh, is uh, tutodia, and it just basically means for this reason. So he lays out everything, and then here's the teaching. It basically is, it, it's, it's meant to act as a marker of a switch from biblical exposition to what's called oratory teaching. So he's moving from saying, here's what we get from Scripture, to let me give you a teaching. And then throughout the rest of the book, you'll find that he'll give this teaching and then he'll revert back to some Old Testament scripture and so on and so forth. And that's the dialogue that's taking place. But at the onset, we start with Jesus is supreme. He's not an angel. He's not a messenger. He's not a prophet. He's God. And he reigns on that throne of God forever. So for this reason, here's my exhortation. Here's my teaching. Here's how that applies. And he says, we must pay attention all the more to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. For the message spoken through angels was legally binding and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment. How will we escape if, if we neglect such a great salvation? This salvation had its beginning when it was spoken of by the Lord and is confirmed to us by those who who have heard him. Now, what is being said here is the teaching of the messengers of God, it, it, it's not nullified because of Jesus. And Jesus says this himself. He didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. Now, here's what that means. We're still sinners. Humanity is still corrupt. 
Just because Jesus came doesn't mean that the law is no more and, you know, let's, who cares? Let's go do whatever we want now. What he's saying is, is what was given to us by God's messengers to Moses, to the prophets, to everyone in the Old Testament, it's legally binding. It is true. But what comes through Jesus is, is superior, which means even though what came through the angels in the Old Testament was legally binding, we're not capable of meeting the requirements that was given to us through that legal system. That legal system was meant to point us to something superior to it. It was meant to point us to Jesus. Jesus is how we are saved. Jesus is where the salvation begins. It's where the salvation comes to. And it doesn't diminish the message of the angels, but Jesus is superior to them. So let's look then, from here on out, let's look at what takes place through Jesus. Now, as we continue on in this section, we get to this, to this point here of uh, verses 16 to 18 of chapter 2. And so where at the beginning of the book of, of, of chapter 1, verses 15 through 14, or 5 through 14, we have this appeal to the Old Testament that the author of Hebrews is saying Jesus is superior to what came before. He's not only superior to what came before, he's superior to the messengers who gave what came before. Because he's superior to the angels, we have to understand that it's through him that we have salvation. But the mechanics of that salvation is different than the mechanics of that salvation in the Old Testament. But it also, and this is where it might get a little confusing, it also is the same. So how that system, that, that system of the Old Testament that came through the angels, it establishes a... It, it establishes a system. It establishes a way for salvation to take place. It establishes a, a code of righteousness. It establishes a, a transgression and an atonement. It's something that is, is grounded into the formation of creation. Meaning, if we go all the way back to Adam and Eve, what took place as soon as Adam and Eve sinned? Well, they went and hid themselves. They covered themselves, and they hid from God. They sinned. They realized they were naked. They realized they were inadequate. So in order to cover their inadequacies, they took fig leaves and covered themselves. And when God came, they hid from God because they still realized they were inadequate. But what did God do before kicking them out of the garden? He killed some animals, and he clothed them with garments, which means he made atonement. That, that same word that is used for covering of Adam and Eve is the same word we get in the sacrificial system of the law of Moses for atonement, for covering. Now, that type of covering, it's established in Adam and Eve in, in the fall of humanity. It brings itself into the code of Israel, but it can't sustain our, salva our salvation. While it can't sustain our salvation, it is a precursor to what does sustain our salvation, which is Christ. And so we get this section here in Hebrews 2, verses 16 through 18, where it says, For it is clear that he does not reach out to help angels, but to help Abraham's offspring. Therefore, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way, so that he could make so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest pertaining to God and matters pertaining to God to make atonement so to make a covering for the sins of the people for since he himself has suffered when he was tempted he is able to help those who are tempted so the point is that Jesus lowered himself he is superior to the angels he is sitting on the throne he reigns with God at God's right hand he's superior but he was made lower. He was lessened. He was diminished. And, and that word there in, in the Greek is a word that is, in, in, in verse 7 of, of chapter 2, it's a word that's emphasizing that Jesus was demoted, so to speak. 
not that he as himself is a lesser being now, but that he was given a lesser status than the angels, that he was given a status at the same level, so to speak, as humanity. Because by being human, even though he's still fully God, he's able to relate to us and he's able to cover us. Because God himself is righteous and God himself is outside of our existence, outside of our, not existence, but he's outside of our understanding. Jesus entered into our situation. He entered into our context to cover our sin, to cover our transgressions, to be and do what we could not do for ourselves. And that is what the author of Hebrews is lining out for us. Jesus is our atonement, and this atonement is established in the Old Testament. Jesus' superiority is established in the Old Testament, and Jesus fulfills what is needed for our salvation that we could never accomplish on our own accord. That's what the author is laying out here. Now, the question that we'll have moving forward is now what does that look like? What does it mean for us to have an atonement in Jesus? What does he give us in that atonement? What what happens in that atonement that we are now saved, that we are now, our sins are erased? Where do we go moving forward? And that's where we move next week. We will start to move a little bit deeper into that next week as we continue to study this book of Hebrews. But hopefully... Today, I I encourage you to read through some of these coronation psalms throughout the rest of the week, whether it's Psalm 45, Psalm 102, Psalm 110, Psalm 2, and see how they connect to Jesus. Those are psalms that teach us what it means for God to roll over us. That's something, that's a characteristic of who Jesus is. And yet he lowered himself. He was made lower so that he could cover our sin so that we could be raised up along with him. So keep that in mind as we move forward throughout this book, and as we step a little deeper into what it means for Jesus to make our atonement, to be our atonement, and to also be our high priest. Because we'll continue down that path as we continue in the study, and I I hope you continue reading and studying and diving into this book, and, and I hope that you join us next week as we move into the next section of, of, this, of this study, and we go into Hebrews chapter three verses, or chapter three, verse one through chapter four, verse 13. And we'll see you next week as we continue this study.